Well, I'm glad to have joined me here uh, at NRB, uh, my friend Phil Cook. And Phil and I have interacted quite a bit over the last few years, and I feel like we're at, at the same meetings and stuff. And now, obviously, in this new role at NRB, I'd like to – Phil is one of the first people I wanted to kind of talk with about uh, communications. Phil, you are the um, kind of founder, director of Cook Media, um, a filmmaker yeah. – all around communication guru type, is that right? Kind of, sort of, yeah. We're based here in Los Angeles and I've spent my career, you know, we've done all kind of stuff over the years from movies to television specials, Super Bowl commercials, all kind of stuff. But yeah. I've really focused on trying to help Christians use the media more effectively. I think that, uh, you know what, we're a media driven culture and we need to learn to speak that language if we're gonna make an yeah. impact with the church, with ministries, with nonprofit organizations. So that's kind of where we're focused. Yeah, and it, it seems um, we're in a communication age, right? That we're in an age of a visual age, communication age, that uh, whether or not you're a, you consider yourself a media organization or, or whatever, you, you kind of are, no matter what kind of organization you are, you have to communicate. So I want to specifically talk about the kind of strange environment we're in now with, with the coronavirus, and, and uh, we're several months into uh, kind of shutdown, although a lot of states are opening up, thankfully. Um, yeah. But this has been an interesting time for to communicate. I mean, on the one hand, I would say, you know, the kind of ministries that are at NRB are really made for this moment where we're delivering spiritual content uh, over a variety of mediums, right? Whether it's radio, TV, digital, film. Um, so in some ways, it's it's really a, a good you know we're 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 made for this. On the other hand, you know, it's 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 a time of um, challenge for a lot of ministries. Uh, right now, where, where a lot of basic operations are shut down, churches particularly can't meet, uh, although some are starting to meet up. Uh, fundraising is a little bit difficult at this moment. Um, so I guess I, I, my first question to you is, um, what are you counseling Christian communicators to do in this moment? What are you uh, counseling ministries to do um, to, to be faithful in this moment? It's a great question. Um, and, and literally since the beginning of this shutdown, I've been flooded with calls from pastors, communication people, church media people, um, wondering what to do, what are the answers, how should we be doing it? It's interesting that um, before this shutdown, LifeWay Research actually reported that 41% of churches in America have never offered anything online to their congregation. Mm. No worship experience, no resources, nothing. And I think that's dramatically changed over the last number of weeks. I think pastors finally realize, and, and you know, it's, it, there's really two things happening here. Um, one is that I think if you could say anything good has come out of this whole crisis. One is that pastors finally realize the people on the other end of that live stream are a legitimate congregation. Mm. You have no idea the number of pastors over the years that have told me, you know, Phil, you know, I don't mind doing a live stream, but that's really not ministry. You know, online ministry really isn't ministry. Well, let me tell you, they've changed their tune big time. And what's funny is before the shutdown, we had clients, we were working with churches that were really intentional about that live stream, really intentional. And they were getting as many as a, as much as a third of their total income just from their live stream audience. I had a pastor friend of mine who preaches to 6,000 people on Sunday and he called me one day last, last summer and said, hey, this past summer, my live stream audience gave more than my 6,000 member congregation. Mm. So it, it really shows that if you are intentional, if you treat them, you know, if you welcome them, make them a part of your church family, they will respond. So I think churches over the long haul have realized that. The other thing is that Christian communicators, whether you're a radio station, television station, an internet company, filmmaker, whatever, We've suddenly seen viewership and listening listenership goes through the roof. I mean, it's interesting. I'm getting reports from network after network after network telling me that they're getting more listeners than ever, more viewers than ever. So I think this is the moment for Christian communicators to really step up and make a difference out there. This is this is our moment, if you will, and I love seeing that. Yeah, I think I think you're right. And one of the things that excites me about, I mean, look, the the coronavirus. You know, this whole thing has been a strange time, a hard and difficult time for the country, for a lot of ministries, for a lot of people, whether you're at the front lines helping fight the disease, fight the virus, or you're one of the many small businesses that have had to kind of shut down. So it's been a hard, 
and difficult time. One of the interesting things, the silver lines, I think, I think coming out of this, Phil, and may, maybe I'm wrong, a lot of churches and organizations are going to say, okay, we had to cobble together and put together our online content yeah. in a hurry. We realize, hey, we can do this and we want to get better at it. And one of the things I, I want to just give a, a plug for the NRB convention next year, it's, you know, it's in March, so a long ways off, but one of the ways I think we should be thinking is, okay, we're a smaller, medium-sized church that did a live stream. Let's, let's figure out how we can get better, you know? And I think that's where we can help equip folks to say, we know we can do this. What are, what are some tweaks we can make to make our, our live stream an even better experience? You're exactly right. I mean, the minute you go online as a church or a ministry organization, you become a global media ministry. Uh, yeah. Statistically, a significant number of your live stream audience will be international. And I think a lot of pastors have been really surprised. Let, I, let me read this text to you. Um, I, this is a really interesting text. A friend of mine is a pastor of 900 people in the South. And uh, he sent me this text. I wrote a blog post at my blog at philcook.com about what we should be thinking about as we emerge from this crisis. And he immediately texted me, and you'll just love this. He said, you know, Phil, when this crisis started, we only had 80 YouTube subscribers. Now we have 23,000. Wow. He said, my Easter message has been viewed by 1.5 million people. Mm. He said, in the last few weeks, we've had more than 95,000 views of our church service. He said, we're actually reaching far more people now than we've ever reached in our history. He said, I, I wish I felt bad saying this, but I, I'm really not in a hurry to get back in the building. <laughs> Uh, and I'm hearing that from a lot of pastors that have really embraced this. You know, obviously we like to be in the building. Obviously we like to get people together, but pastors that are really embracing this moment and, you know, radio station operators, television station and mm -hmm. network operators, people that see the possibilities here, I think are the people that they're, they're going to merge out of this in a much stronger position. Well, and, and I also think that the possibility of, of sharing messages and content has never been easier. And, yeah. um, you know, look, all of us, we long for the day we can be back in our churches. And for some states, that's sooner rather than others. Um, in California, I mean, I don't know if you'll be back in your church before Jesus comes, but... Um, our overlords are keeping us home for a very yeah. long time here. Don't get me started on that. <laughs> but we, we all want to be back in the building because I do think there's, an, yeah. there's a there, there, part of worship is embodied worship and being with people. But what's interesting about the potential of what's going on is... You know, the, the digital world is almost the front door for the church, right? So the first interaction people have with our church now, it seems, is through our website, maybe totally. something someone shared. Yeah. And this is one of the reasons that I think there's potential here for us at NRB and for our, our, the way we equip people and for our churches and ministries is how do we help churches get better at the front door? Uh, small, medium-sized, larger churches, better at the front door, better at, you know, where the internet might reach the, the people who are not quite ready to make the commitment to come on Sunday morning. They're a little nervous, but they may watch a live stream or two or three or a month or two months. How do we get better at that? So the experience is, is better without even, you know, without sacrificing anything we believe, but how do we make that experience better? That's, that's a great question. And, and you're exactly right, by the way. Um, you know, pastors suffer from a disease of that they, they generally prioritize the people they see in front of them on a Sunday, you know, in the mm -hmm. pew. When they, you know, they may have 100 people there, 500 people there, but they could have 5,000 or 20,000 people actually online. We don't, they don't think about that. And, and yet, so important. And your comment about websites are true. In my experience doing this all these decades, I've been doing it. In my experience, virtually 100% will check of uh, people will check out a church online before they visit. So mm -hmm. why in the world would your web website be lame? You know, in many ways, if that website is what determines whether or not people visit, that should be the most amazing thing you do. It should be an incredible experience, and you should put a lot of effort and time and work into making your web experience really, really remarkable. So, and, and the other thing too is Dan, we forget that. Um, these are not just transient people. We Think of all the people in your church, students who are away at college that would love mm -hmm. to look in on your service. Think of all the people that were church members, but now have moved to another city. Um, business people on the road, my wife Kathleen and I travel all the time, and wherever we are on a Sunday, she'll pop open her laptop and we'll watch our church live stream. Mm -hmm. So from anywhere in the world. 
And so I think that when churches start embracing the fact and realizing that that's a legitimate audience out there, a legitimate congregation, they'll start seeing their impact really, really grow. And, and I have to say, after all this, funny, Dan, a lot of pastors are telling me, hey, what do we do? Because I've spent the last few months telling my, my, my congregation how awesome online worship is. How in the world will I ever get them back, back in the building? And uh, the one thing I'm hoping is that we don't let up the gas on this live stream once we do go back to normal, if you will. I, I just think that this is not the time to think, okay, it's over. Let's not worry about the live stream so much. No, 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 no. This is the time to get your message out there to more and more people. People And like you say, we have more platforms, more technology, more ways to do it than ever. Paul founded the church on letters. That was the technology of his mm -hmm. day. And yet the letters got the job done. But today, think of all the things we have, even this. I mean, th there are two film festivals now in the country for movies made on iPhones. Mm. So don't tell me that you don't have the ability or the technology to get your message to a bigger audience. Right. And th that's such a great point. And even as we open up our churches, you know, someone watching this right now, pastors watching this right now may are likely going through the phases of how they're going to reopen. Some have already reopened in some states. Um, but nobody is just opening everything up how it was pre COVID. Right. So there, there, even in the short term, there has to be a robust online presence for a lot of folks, especially vulnerable people who, who can't, um, you know, come. You can't, you're, like, you're, you're you know, exactly okay. right. We, so we, need we to transi transition this, and the live stream is going to help us do it. Yeah. Okay. And I think long term, I think what a lot of pastors are discovering is that, you know, online church doesn't replace church, but uh, what it does is, you know, it'll be there uh, even long term to where folks who are shut ins, folks who are checking out your church, who want to yeah. see what it's like, who want to know what an experience is like. Um, I, I think are going to be doing that. So I, it, it does no seem question. to be very important. The, I guess the, the other thing I want to talk to you about is we talked a lot about online and web, which I think is very important, but talk to me a little bit about how, um, you know, traditional broadcast ministries are, are serving people in this time. I think of, um, you know, um, uh, Christian TV stations, Christian radio, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm someone who, you know, one of the things that excited me about coming to NRB, frankly, was, it's almost come full circle. Cause when I was in college, you know, listening to, to preaching and teaching on Moody radio in Chicago was very formative. Guys like Chuck Swindoll, David Jeremiah, yeah. you know, Alistair Begg, all these guys, RC Sproul. And uh, maybe speak about how those mediums are really serving people during this season as well. Your, your music stations, your teaching stations, and, and really how, why those are so important. I think they're incredibly important right now. <clears throat> One of the things that, um, uh, you know, research over and over again is showing us that obviously people are migrating to the web in normal amounts or in, in you know, in, in huge numbers, but the migration is not happening nearly as quickly as we thought. Mm -hmm. Plus, what I think is even more important, when they go online, they're mostly watching entertainment, television, content, whatever. They're mostly watching content that was created for broadcast. I was mm -hmm. sitting on a plane before the shutdown. I was on a plane. And um, a lady next to me was watching a Christian television program on her iPad. And mm. that program, I could look at it and tell it was made for broadcast television. So they're just because they're exchanging hardware, they're not watching it on their TV in their living room anymore. Maybe they're watching on their computer or their iPad. Doesn't mean they've ditched television. So, in fact, <clears throat> I read an interesting survey the other day that said something like 80% of millennials still walk in, just plop down on the sofa and want to see what's on TV. So that whole appointment thing has gotten blown way out of proportion. The bottom line in all this is when it comes to a national crisis, when it comes to the globe wanting to find out what's going on, it's mm -hmm. interesting to go to radio and television every time. Um, that's when that spikes. I mean, it's, it's a reason I'm, I'm here in Hollywood and I can tell you ad time on secular TV networks is going up. It's more expensive than ever to be on television. And that's because it's really America's last great campfire. You know, when people are online, they're watching a million different web pages. Even on Facebook, they're watching everybody's individual web pages. So it's incredibly scattered. But research indicates there's a handful of television channels people aggregate to the most, which means television, radio still bring vast, vast audiences to the table. So I just, you know, and the, and the, the most interesting thing to me is that when movies were invented back at the turn of the last century, that didn't get rid of live events. 
And then when radio came along, it didn't get rid of movies. And then when television came along, it didn't get rid of radio. And now mm -hmm. that the internet's come along, it's not going to get rid of television, radio, movies, or live events. It, nothing displaces media. It all just finds its own new level out there. So there will always be, in my, my thinking, there will always be a place for traditional television, traditional radio, mm -hmm. as well as the online world. I use a mix of all of that stuff. And even my daughter, who gets all of her te television programs from an online source, she's still watching broadcast television, even though she's not getting it through an antenna or a cable network. So I just think it's important that we realize that things are not shifting as radically as, we, as they are, which means Christian broadcasters, this is a great moment to step up. Don't operate in fear, operate in confidence out there because the research doesn't back up the fear. It, it backs up the confidence. And by the way, let me say this, Dan, and I'll shut up. But I, 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 like I said, I'm here in Hollywood, here in LA, and I can look out my window, my office window, and I can see Walt Disney Studios, Warner Brothers Studios, Universal Studios, and guess what? They're ghost towns. They're completely shut down, which tells me right now, Christian media is producing more content than secular media. Mm. We're producing more. The church is producing more material than Hollywood is right now. Mm. And so I'm seeing churches every week cranking stuff out. In fact, if you're a communication person or a media person for a local church or ministry, you know that you've probably worked harder in the last couple of months than you've worked in the last year combined. So I just think it's interesting that right now in this moment in time, Christians are producing more content than Hollywood is. And that's a really interesting thing. I agree with that. And what's really, I'm curious to see when this is all over, you know, the gospel going out over all these different mediums and what God's going to do with that. I heard Tim Keller say a few weeks ago that there's going to be people who will say, I became a Christian during the coronavirus uh, crisis. Oh, yeah. um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the Christian media, which excites me. And, and this is obviously the NRB's desire and mission is to equip Christian communicators, whatever medium God calls us to. We didn't even talk about film, but one of the, one of yeah. the, um, one of the great series that, that people are continually talking about online is the chosen, uh, you know, the story of, of, of Jesus. And there's all this great Christian film stuff that's happening too. So I just think it's going to be a, a good time. And I, you know, we want to encourage folks to engage with NRB and, and come yeah. in March next year to Texas as we uh, try to equip Christian communicators, people like, like Phil Cook to come and listen to him. <laughs> well, I'll be there. I'll be there. And I may be wearing a mask. I don't know, but I'll be there. <laughs> and uh, I think, you know, and, and let me say, let me just say this to Christian communicators out there. If you're a radio, t uh, radio, TV, filmmaker, internet person, whatever you are, let me give you a couple thoughts that I'm seeing happening as we emerge from this crisis. I mean, it's interesting that, uh, Dan, research, study after study after study indicates that companies that advertise and promote themselves through a crisis are companies that emerge in the most stable, powerful position at the end. They're the ones that do the best, which means now people are hunkering down, they're pulling back, the competition is less. And I know in the church, we don't think of, you know, of it as competition so much, but the truth is, radio stations, television stations, churches that are marketing, advertising, promoting themselves during this time are the ones that people will remember when we emerge. So for radio stations, for instance, now is the time to get local churches to advertise on your radio station or TV station. I always tell pastors, be out there in newspaper ads, radio spots, commercials, sponsored boost, boosting your sponsored ads and stuff on, on social media. This is the time to advertise. It seems, you know, you know, conflicting, but the truth is, study after study shows that you'll do better coming out if you're advertising, promoting yourself. Also, I'd say this, Dan, and that is, you know, people hate to change. I did a book, one of my first published books was called Jolt, Get the Jump on a World That's Constantly Changing. And it was really about how to position yourself for this accelerating rate of change that's happening in our culture, mostly due to media. And uh, one of the things I, I discovered in the, writing the book was research that indicated People hate to change. It's one of the most difficult things people will ever, ever do. In fact, so a, a study came out that showed a significant number of open heart surgery patients with just a, within a year or two of their surgery will go back to their old lifestyle, the same one that got them there in the first place. And so the fear of death doesn't even make people change. But I've discovered that when you emerge from a crisis, keep in mind right now on the news, on TV commercials, all we're hearing is there's going to be a new normal. Things are never going to be the way they were. Things are going to change. Get used to, you know, things being different. We hear that over and over, which means 
People are ready for a change probably more than they've ever been in a very, very long time, which means if you're a, a communicator, whether you're a media company or TV, radio, whatever, now is the time. If you've been thinking about rebranding, if you've been thinking about changing your name, if you've been changing about organizational changes, program changes, content changes, whatever, as we emerge from this crisis, believe me, this is the moment to make that happen because people are much more open to change. They're expecting it because what they hear every single day in the media. So I'm just going to say that, that if you're a professional broadcaster uh, or media professional and you've thought you've got, and everybody has that laundry list of things they've always thought they'd like to change, this could be your time. New logo, new branding, new look, new voice, new feel, whatever. This, I think, is the moment to make that happen. Yeah, I agree with that. And, um, you know, in, in many ways, this has forced a lot of people to, to deeper levels of engagement. So I'm talking to pastors all around the country who technology is actually allowing them to shepherd in a way that maybe they weren't even doing before to keep up with their people. There's more of an impetus to do that. And I think that'll continue on. So um, this is good. Well, Phil Cook, thanks for joining us today. Hey, and real. thankful for just kind of your deep involvement and engagement with NRB and uh, we want to continue to to see how the Lord uses us as uh, Christian communicators going forward. Let me, as a board member, let me welcome you to the team, man. I'm so thrilled that you're a part of this because, uh, I mean, a director of communications for an organization of communicators is, is an incredibly important role. And uh, you've got amazing experience. You've, you're, you've got a lot of expertise. And I'm just really thrilled that you're on board because we do want to get the message out that if you're a Christian, you're a professional communicator, you need to be, part of this, be a part of this group because the world is changing and we need to get together, really discuss, teach, do workshops, understand how that change is happening so we can be out there on the cutting edge and, and be relevant for a new generation. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, we'll, we'll continue to have, try to have content like this to, to help equip communicators going forward.